I'm not looking too good these days. I'm very tired. I mean, you can see my, my eyes always look like this. I've always had really big dark circles under my eyes. But people have said that I haven't looked too good as of late. Is it the fact that I hate facial hair but refuse to cut any of it off? I don't know. Um, maybe I'll grow a beard. I don't, I don't know. I don't really care. Not as much as I used to, at least. But it still brings out some physical discomfort. Looking at my own face, I just don't really care as much as I used to. That's the weird thing. You know, these little things, you, you feel uncomfortable about them. And it's not a matter of doing them enough times in order to not feel com uncomfortable about them necessarily. Some things are just pathologically stuck in your brain. But they get easier, right? They, they get easier. You become more accepting of them. You, know, you sort of release that uh, desire to have them. And then the, f the feeling of wanting it gets easier. I don't know. I'm pretty fine with showing my face wherever I go. I, I don't really care if people want to see my face or see what I look like. When I was like 15, um, not so much 15, but like 14 and 13, I was really uh, self-conscious about how I looked. I, I thought about it all the time. Now I just go everywhere. I don't care. It, who cares? I ask incels to make fun of me. I will actively ask incels to make fun of the way that I look. I just don't care. It, there's a level where it'll it'll feel disgusting to me to look at my own body or my own face, but when I really sit down and I think about it, it, it the monstrosity just makes the character more funny. You know, like the things about the way that I look that I hate, it just adds into the story. Is that when you start practicing life, when you you know when you make your your life uh, a continuous narrative, the way that I view it, you know, I, I see everything I do as like a movie. It, you being the character in the story, the imperfections about you aren't really imperfections, they're just adding to the story as it goes along. Um, and so maybe this internal suffering that I have with my own face and body is uh, just part of how the story goes. And thinking about that, it makes me care a lot less. Um, thinking about the way that you think makes me care a lot less too. Because you're probably pretty dumb, like me. Look at this, okay? It's a hot pocket. A hot pocket became stuck in inside of in, inside of my door. A hot pocket was jamming my door. There was okay, there were two seconds there. It's two seconds between life and death. The hot pocket gets placed down, but it wasn't it wasn't placed down. It was there, it was over there. It gets swept up and moved around by the door. The door pushes it in, the door pushes it under, and then it jams. That wasn't a jam, but it jams into the door. This is this is quantum level mechanics here that I'm that I'm explaining to you. It it was it was over there. It swept it up somehow. I don't even know how it swept it up. Am I a physician? I don't think so. It swept it up, and then it jammed the door. And I heard a sound, and the door was jammed. That was pretty jammed, bro. Jam-packed, one might say. It was packing the door. A package, a package that was made to pack a hot pocket, which is uh, essentially bread um, being packed with cheese and meats and stuff. A package that was used for a packed food was now packing the underbelly of my door, keeping it from closing properly. What an ironic existence to live in. Package, it's not like the package has an existence, you know? The package doesn't have a soul, it doesn't have a mortal coil, it, it just sort of exists, right? But we, we sort of apply these little stories to every single thing we do. You know, like, I look at it and I think, oh, you know, what's the story behind the little guy here, the little man, the package, the person? Um, and it isn't as if it's an actual person, but you sort of caricaturize everything. You know, you think of like, what are the most stereotypical elements of, of this basic household item, and how can I blow him out of proportion? What's his journey? What's his story? You know, where did he come from? 
I, I love stuff like that. Just looking at little things throughout the house and, and thinking, oh, you know, <laughs> well, what funny scenarios has this fella got himself into? I look at someone like my dog and I can't even come up with those things with my dog because he's a living, breathing creature. It's not like myself. With myself, I can, you know, I can I can sort of meme up, you know, the, the storyline of Star. My dog, he's an autonomous entity. He, he has his own thing going on. He has his own story to tell. We just can't communicate with the language for him to tell it. And so I just sort of exist, letting him be peaceful, letting him do his own thing, um, as I watch him do it, as you just observe. Now, there are times when talking isn't really necessary. When you just watch something happen and you sort of take in the experience, that's how I feel with animals. So, you know, all of these little household items, the reason why it's so easy to come up with a wacky story that you can make out of them is because they don't exist. You know, they, they don't have uh, fundamental qualities the way that a dog would or emotions that you attach to them based on personal experience. They don't just exist. They're, they're things, you know? They're, they're not living, breathing creatures like this that have a certain essence to them. Um, and so I, I don't I don't really make as many jokes about oh my dog he's like a he's like a doctor dude and and that's ha 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 things that dogs do I don't really do that because it's it's less fun to add a sort of storyline or a sort of character to a dog um, than it is to apply very strange connotations and settings to you know uh, inanimate objects I think that's cool. That's a bit of a lie, though, because I still make funny memes about my dog. I don't even know what I'm on about today. What I'm saying is that life is full of these little stories that you can tell. If not the kind of story where I'm, you know, sitting here and saying, Ah, yes, this spoon has had this amazing journey that I can tie to just about everything in this room. If not that kind of story, then just the fact that it exists is a story in and of itself. It's not, you know, a complex story. It's not something that has a lot of direct details that you can attach yourself to. But the story is that it does exist. And so, you know, the if you look at, like, um, you know, Slice of Life anime, for instance. A slice of Life anime, most of it is just doing completely mundane things. Um, but there's, there's a studiedness to it. You know, this, this term studied casualness often comes about with Japan. Is that in their... Uh, media and the things that they make, uh, there's uh, constantly little details being made to be precise or mundane details being made to be precise to express the most that they can um, about uh, those specific things. Um, and even in daily life, you know, if you look at like Confucianism and Buddhism and these other things, there's an emphasis on applying principles and, um, you know, uh, training, training yourself to do even the most mundane things the most ideally. And uh, I, I was thinking about this idea um, in the context of normal experiences, just everyday experiences. Um, they may not be literally studied to a T uh, to just do them, um, but they are stories in and of themselves. They're little stories. They're contained stories, and you can extrapolate things out of them. And that's beautiful. It's pretty. It's pretty to do that. They're all over the place. You want a better version of that point? Go watch the video, Hidamari Sketch Bath Scenes In-Depth Analysis by my friend No Thank You. He explains how life is art, and uh, it basically validated every single point of view I've had about the world for, <laughs> I don't know, the last ten fucking years or whatever. I've been saying that life is art for a long time. It is. It just is. Everything is art. If I spit on the ground, if I kill a bear and spit on the ground next to the bear or on the bear and I say it's art, that's art because it expresses something. If you make something and it expresses something, it's art. If it communicates, it's art because the goal of art is communication and it's communicating and you just did it. You don't have to agree with what it's communicating, it's communicating and that's the point is that it communicated something. So it's art. If I make toilet paper, who's to say? Who's to say me, the toilet paper craftsman, doesn't have, you know, like, you can just look at it individually and go, yeah, I interpreted a lot about this toilet paper. This guy, he really loved to make toilet paper. That was, like, his deal. 
And I, I get emotions out of that. It communicated something to me. Even if it's as simple as uh, being communicated a simple utility, it's still art. You can never get rid of art. Art is constantly existing, constantly expanding on itself. You know, like, like genes, it's, it's adapting to its environment. It's always changing depending on the context and those with which it was spread to. The influence is everlasting. It goes forever. And uh, I think that's pretty cool. Okay, the jig is up and I don't know how to do a jig, and you're currently on a conveyor belt of some kind. Basically this is a, uh, well, I'll, I'll let you figure out what this is. What I was, what I was getting on about here um, was there were two experiences in particular that I've been thinking about a lot recently um, that had a pretty profound impact on my life, and I, I'm going to uh, do them in order of time, uh, in the time in which they had happened, was that the first one occurred in uh, 2018. I was uh, 16 years old, um, you know, I, I still had a bit of a ways uh, to turning 17. Birthday was in April, I left home in December of that year. Um, but I ran away from home uh, in order to, to go hang out in this, in this shelter for gay people, essentially, you know, fags, literal fags. Um, and, uh, it, the idea was that, you know, I don't want to live here, living here is so depressing, and there's all this bad stuff going on all the time, you know, parents arguing, blah, 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 and I just decided, yeah, it's time to go, time to, time to head out, Kentucky, all the way to New York, let's go, let's do it, and, um, I, I, I don't, I don't know how much of it was up to me just through like sheer intuition um, just deciding this and, and not being afraid uh, or how much of it was uh, retardation, uh, will to survive, the medications I was on, it could be any number of factors, all kinds of things. I do know that um, when I tampered off or when I was off my medication that I had been taking up to that point um, I had a bit of psychosis going on in the big city just because there were so many cars everywhere and so much external stimuli, it really overwhelmed me. Um, so I think medication, probably on some level, had to do with um, me actually getting there. Uh, I think I probably would have had the courage worked up to go there without it, but uh, it significantly helped, essentially. Um, but. I was definitely not on medication for most of the duration of time that I was in New York because I had to spend this huge amount of time in this like child processing facility after the homeless shelter that I went to essentially ratted me out. They reported me to, uh, I think it was called AES or something, it was like the the... New York version of Child Protective Services, and I had to stay in this office for an entire day. Um, it was very, very boring. I met some interesting characters there. I helped uh, this mom through her, like, emotional problems and helped her with, like, her relationship with her daughter, gave her a hug. She started crying, and it was, it was sort of funny because I had to leave really quickly at the time. Um, and so they, they said, uh, you know, hey, star, come up, let's go. And she said, oh, hey, uh, so you're, you're going to go get your kid? And I had this little funny moment. I went, no, I am the kid. And everybody laughed. That was fun. But I, I walked out. And I walk out to go take my shower and blah, blah, blah. And uh, eventually, after, after all of this time, I'm basically stuck in this facility where I'm sleeping around a whole bunch of other people on these really hard beds. All of them are black. There was one Asian kid, but yeah, basically everyone there was black. Um, these kids who seem to have pretty hardcore emotional issues, you know, getting into fights and shouting at each other all the time, this kind of stuff. And I was quiet the whole time. I would like pretend to be a Christian, so you know, go with God, be peaceful, this kind of thing, um, in order to just make myself seem inoffensive. Uh, but other than that, I basically kept to myself and was very, very quiet. 
I would intentionally lay in bed for hours a, a day until they just forced me out of bed, just so I wouldn't have to interact with anybody. Because that's how, that's how violent these kids were. They were getting into fights all the time. Uh, there was one instance in particular of the, um, I don't know what you would call him, a guard or something? He, he just worked there helping process the kids. Uh, slammed one of the black kids who was fighting with the other black kid into the wall and started, like, shouting the N-word at him. This was an adult man slamming this kid into the wall. And the wall had glass on it, too. A part of the wall was stone, the other part was glass. That wasn't very cool. Um, but, yeah, so it was a pretty hardcore place. Uh, one could say I was a bit fearful uh, for my own safety being in this situation. Um, but I pressed through it, you know, for a couple days, it took my family to get there. My family gets there, a rented car, and uh, takes me home. And by this point, the consequences of what I had done, or whatever consequences I would face, I didn't care at all at that point, because I had to just deal with walking around the street, uh, going to a homeless shelter, and um, dealing with uh, terrifying, uh, violent, violent kids. Holy cow, who is that? Shut the fuck up. Anyway, um, but yeah, that, that, so that wasn't fun. Um, and after that experience, I wasn't afraid of very many things. I went outside just fine. No, no agoraphobia going on, anything like that. It's like, so once you hit rock bottom, what is there to be afraid of? Um, but not all the fears had gone away, and I'll demonstrate to you what I'm talking about here. See these, you've probably heard of these things before, they're called windows. I used to be very, very afraid of seeing windows, of, of, of just having uncovered windows around. It was like something that triggered a fear in me. Not always, but it was common. I, I, didn't, I didn't like windows. I, I would try to avoid windows to the outside whenever I could because it just made me irritable. Now, most of the time, I can walk up to windows. I can look just fine. Um, you know, I've had my experiences walking outside at various times, but specifically windows. Specifically windows bothered me a lot. I don't know what that was about. I can look out windows fine now. It's holes. Yeah, trying to avoid the holes in the windows so I, I don't look out them. That was a good time. Um, seems like, it seems like 2018 specifically I hallucinated a lot more than I do now. Probably a side effect of, a uh, long-term side effect of how many medications I took at the time. So many that uh, ended up making my symptoms worse because, you know, psychiatric medicine always does that. Um, but oh, I can look at windows just fine now, and it's no problem. Maybe you could attribute it to being liberated from fear um, in that situation of, you know, running away from home, being at rock bottom, blah, blah, blah. Whatever it was, I'm not afraid of them now. What happened in 2019? Hmm. All of these, all of the, hmm. December. What is it with December with me? It's like I want to end December on a high note every single time because this next one also occurred in December. I don't know why I'm intentionally making myself sound like a showman throughout this entire video. It's all, there's a, a veneer of inauthenticity to it, I think. I don't know what that's about. What are you about? If I told you about drugs, psychoactive substances, things that you put in your body to alter your mental state and level of consciousness, or maybe not level of consciousness, but just type of consciousness. I don't want to get... I don't want to get all weird, earthy, hippie with you. Not, not today, at least. Um, things that change your perception in some way by having put it orally, smoked, whatever. It, drugs. You know what those are. Hopefully. Um, have I told you about those? Well, well, I would be what one might call a purveyor of them. Uh, a connoisseur, if you will. I, I study a lot of information about drugs. I've done a lot of drugs, especially for someone of my age. I'm very interested in them. Um, I talk very often about um, reducing harm, quote-unquote, or how to do them without uh, experiencing a lot of the negative effects you might without arming yourself with knowledge and this kind of thing. It's a passion of mine. It's one of my favorite things ever. I love them. Um, but there's a few bad experiences I've had, and one of them stands out in my memory as one of the worst.
This experience I'm talking about, of course, has to do with a little substance called spice, or synthetic marijuana, as many people might call it. Now, spice is interesting, because essentially what it is, is, uh, you know, crushed up, like, leaves and plants, just like grass, random stuff that, that you just get out of plants, um, with uh, certain synthetic cannabinoids like K2 or K4, sometimes they're mixed together, uh, you know, there's other ones involved. I think MM016 is one of them, or something like that, don't quote me. Um, there's a bunch of different synthetic cannabinoids that exist. They just contract like a company in China um, with a slight alteration to an already existing cannabinoid, and then boom, you've got a whole new chemical. Um, and the people who make these spice products, they're very nifty with all of the new ones that come out. Um, especially because the spice that you used to buy in gas stations like K2 and K4 are banned now. So you can't, you have to get them illegally from a dealer basically unless you're buying them off like the, the clear net, one of the newer versions of it because it just makes so many damn, so many damn alterations of the ones that already existed. Um, but there was a, there was a trusted individual, you know, someone, someone who uh, is, you know, generally important to me. Uh, who I trust as a human being, um, you know, who handed me these two two joints, two joints of spice, you know, not not weed. It was expected that it was weed, um, but he had gotten it from a shady guy, you know, a, a, what we might call a bad guy uh, who sells things saying that they sold one thing and actually sold you another. Um, and the guy who was purchasing this, um, you know, I, he, he just didn't think to check properly at the time and just sort of gave them over to this other guy who I had gotten them from. Um, and so, you know, here I am, you know, middle of December, post kidney stone surgery, I've got four hydrocodone pills down my throat, um, you know, in, in order to deal with the pain I was experiencing and uh, other reasons. Um, and I, I'm, I'm so happy because, you know, these blunts were just given to me, his friend, um, friend of Star, uh, you know, um, and I would smoke to like basically half of it. It, it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't like one or two hits, like what you're supposed to do with spice, because spice is so potent that you're only supposed to smoke it one or two hits. I did like half of the blunt, um, or half of the joint. It wasn't a blunt. Um, and the effects, because the effects of spice take longer to come on than, you know, something like normal weed, uh, it doesn't really hit you until after. So I took the first hit and I didn't really think anything was going on. I was like, huh, that's kind of weird. This weed doesn't taste right. This seems like bad weed. And so of course I smoke it until like half of it is gone. And at that point, I'm just blown out of the water. No thank you is doing this like CSGO live stream, and I'm ranting to him about how I feel like a death grip song and how I can feel sound and stuff. And at this point, I was so irritable that I could not properly like read text uh, and stuff or write text. I was trying to, and I was doing it pretty decently because I got a degree of consciousness up there. Um, but I'm hearing like police sirens and is manic is all hell. Uh, and at this point, it's when the bad feels start coming on. The very, very bad NDE feels start coming on. Yes, in December I had essentially overdosed on spice. I had two joints that were given to me by, by a close ally, we might say. He had to quickly, he had to leave quickly, but said, I'm not sure about these, before heading back to work. With spice, you should only take one or two hits, and they take a moment to kick in, unlike with weed. The spice was particularly nasty because it had bug killer and some kind of amphetamine in it. He got it from a meth head friend of his who sometimes comes over to our house. I had four hydrocodone pills in my system before taking the first hit, which likely reduced the physical chest pain I would have been feeling and reduced my heart rate, although clearly not enough given where I'm getting to in the story. I spent a while in my room, with a bit of the other half of the blunt gone, as it was kicking in, I began hearing police sirens that weren't there, feeling as if I were about to die, having sounds physically affect me, feeling sound, in parentheses, light gave me a headache and hurt to see, and my head slash vision were spinning out of control. 
I went to the bathroom to throw up for a while and noticed my heart rate feeling as if it were being driven by a jackhammer. I had never experienced my heart pulsing to the degree that it was. It was fast, very, very fast, with a slamming intensity at each beat. But then, after the vomiting, I couldn't hold myself uh, up at the toilet anymore and collapsed onto the floor. At this point, I was fully convinced I was about to die. My heart kept beating out of my chest until suddenly it became very slow. Slower and slower and slower. I passed out, feeling as though my heart had stopped. When I woke up, I breathed in, <gasps> shocked that I was awake at all, with an immense pain my, in my body and chest. Most likely, I did permanent heart damage, uh, according to someone who had similarly heinous experience with doing it at a big amount of with doing a big amount of spice at once and damaging his heart as a result um so yeah that was that was a near death experience is that i i basically i did too much of that that gross stuff and my heart it was like you know heart and then uh I was I was pretty pretty frantic. Big heart, big heart. And then it goes. Where'd the heart go? I think I'm asleep now. That was basically yeah. That that was yeah.